<laughs> Greetings, mammalians. Welcome to Wall Street Wildlife. The investing podcast will help you better understand how to make money in the stock market. I'm Christoph Monkey Pikarski. And I'm Luke the Badger Hallard. Today is December the 4th of 2023. Christmas is rolling in. We've got an interesting set of topics for you today. I'm going to pick up that wise conversation from last episode, and I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about ADRs, American Depository Receipts, what they are and when you'd use them. And I'm going to squeeze Badger's shoes about his long-term buy and hold strategy, get back at him for the ways he's been torturing me up to now. <laughs> we got a, a, a somebody in the game is claiming a win. Christoph has had to sell a stock, maybe for the right reasons, maybe for the wrong reasons. He's going to tell you about that. And I will also tell you a little bit more about what crypto is in general, for those of you who are terrified of that industry. Is crypto still a thing? Like it came and it went? Are we still even talking about crypto? We're, we're talking about it, Badger. <laughs> let's get stuck into our first topic, ADRs. Let's get the, uh, let's get the learning out of the way and, uh, and tackle this one. So what is an American depository receipt? And, uh, Actually, Badger, uh, why... may, may I interrupt just for one second? I think uh, the, the reason we're talking about this is not merely to educate, but when I was making our comparative portfolio, uh, I had a devil's time finding the stupid tickers that you decided to invest in because they were not available here on the U.S. markets under the obvious ticker that one would hope. In other words, I was looking for wise. So I typed in like a dutiful monkey, W-I-S-E. And what did I get? I got bubkis. And so uh, because the Badger is over in the UK, there's there's all kinds of uh, shenanigans to get the, the stock. So that's kind of, I think, why we're talking about ADRs in part. If you're a listener, why are you potentially interested in ADRs? Right. So the main reason might be you live in the US, uh, you've got access to maybe a similar exchange to the one that um, Christoph is using. Uh, you're on uh, SoFi, I think, and SoFi don't offer the London Stock Exchange as a tradable market. And whichever platform you're using to do trading maybe doesn't offer all the markets you want, but you might still want to invest overseas, like you want to get some international diversification. There's a couple of companies I own that trade outside the US, but are listed in the US, companies like Mercado Libre. But if you want to buy a company like Wise, or uh, there's a, a few others I own, which are great quality, incredible companies, you can still buy them through the ADR. So what is an ADR? It's kind of like a proxy for the international share. And um, the benefits of buying the ADR rather than buying like the original primary listing in its home country is you basically get to trade in US dollars. If you're a dollars guy, it means you haven't got to do that like crazy uh, Fahrenheit centigrade kind of translations in your head. You just kind of know what you're dealing with dollars. and means the exchange is open your trading hours. So, you know, 9.30 to 4.30, whatever the time is, you're not having to set your alarm clock to trade on like the Hong Kong Stock Exchange or trade on like a European exchange. You can do it during your own time. Um, but there are there are some things you've got to be aware of. It's not totally straightforward. So key thing to remember is like you're still buying a company. You have to understand the company you're buying and do your due diligence, right? I'll always say that, understand what it is you're buying, which means understand what that company's about. And say a company like Wise, they don't list natively in the US, they list in the UK and we have incredibly strong regulations and things you need to do as a public company. So not wildly dissimilar to the US, but you're not gonna find like a 10K and a 10Q and all the standard reporting. So you've got to go and dig and you've got to find out what that country requires the company to report. And in the UK, actually, you only have to report twice a year, not four times a year. So that's worth knowing if you're buying the ADR, you're only going to get that reporting um, less frequently. And you won't find ADRs necessarily on like the NASDAQ and the NICE and the big sort of exchanges that you're familiar with. You'll find it on something called the over, over the counter OTC market, which can be a bit scary because there are a ton of really sketchy, like penny shares and nonsense on there. So like this gold potentially is hidden amongst the muck. Um, you've got to understand what you're up to. And 
The other thing is, like, why is this using that as example? Heavily traded, a high volume stock, uh, very, you know, very mature company that's trading in the UK. But if you buy the ADR, that might have tiny, tiny volumes, potentially, you know, maybe there's not much of a market for that ADR. And I think you asked me last week, Christoph, about you found two different versions of the ADR for WISE. One was um, WPLCF, and the other one I said was WIZEY. So they're typically known as F shares or Y shares, like the last letter is an F or a Y. That tells you a little bit about the nature of the ADR. So generally, the guideline is if you're buying an ADR, buy the one that is just most heavily traded. That's the one that the market kind of accepts. And if you buy something that has higher volume, you're going to get kind of a tighter bid offer spread and you're buying something where there's a market. So you'll be able to sell it without too much complexity. If you buy something where there's only two or three trades a day, um, then you, know, you might actually find it difficult to sell that at a reasonable price that was kind of equivalent to its listing in its home market. So it's something to be aware of. Buy the one that's most heavily traded. If you want to do some research on ADRs, there's a really good resource, I think, published by Deutsche Bank. I'll stick a link in the show notes. And it's basically like an ADR database you can go check out. And it tells you all sorts of useful stuff to know in addition to what you need to know about the main uh, stock. That makes sense, Christoph? Anything I missed? Yeah, yeah, I follow mostly. Uh, you left out an important bit, however. Always use a limit order especially when there's a wide, what's known as a spread between, in the professional uh, lingos, uh, circles, the lingo is the bid and the ask. All that means is people are willing to pay X, that's the bid. The sellers are asking a certain price. And in markets where there is little volume that gap that is known as the spread will be wide because there's money to be made from people that don't know what they're doing the way you escape getting juiced is you put in a limit order that says this is the limit at which i will buy or sell the particular equity and it's mathematical so it will not sell or buy unless that limit is hit this is how you protect yourself. So if you're off fishing for uh, wise in whatever market you choose by whatever alphabet soup you choose to go with, use a limit order. Good advice. And that applies actually to almost anything you buy. It wouldn't hurt you to have a limit in place just to make sure you're paying the price you expect it to pay. Yeah. So before just, we wrap this up. Oh. Well, it's just slightly less relevant than say a stock like Apple because that, you know, there's millions and millions of shares traded every second. And if you part, if you want to buy shares that day, the, the limit price, you know, if you use a market order, you're going to get essentially what's fair in that moment. We're talking about uh, places where there's less volume where it's essential, but yes, Absolutely. in general, it's good advice. Use a limit order, if only because it, it makes it clear to you, you know the price that you're willing to buy and you're not going to go chasing, which is a whole nother topic. Yeah. And maybe in a future episode, we'll come on to like other ways to use limit orders to maybe have a stop loss. I don't generally believe in those, but that's a legitimate strategy people might implement or maybe to, uh, you know, have a planned trade in the future. Limit orders can be quite powerful, quite useful tools for an investor. But before we come off the topic of ADRs, I just want to drop a bit of a bomb, right? They're useful and they're a tool and they're a way to get access to another market in a kind of friendly way, but they can also be traps in disguise. And now let's think about some less mature markets than the UK. Or heck, hey, look, post-Brexit, 10 years time, maybe the UK in the 2030s, right? We seem to be disappearing up our own backsides right over here. Um, ADRs make it easy to invest overseas and it can be a bit seductive perhaps. Oh, this is like I'm buying this thing. It's just like buying a, an Apple share, right? It's in dollars. Uh, it's not that simple. You have to understand not just the company, you've got to understand the market the company operates in. If you're buying something in a developing economy that might have really complex political situation going on, you know, war, right? Like so many countries that we thought were uh, in great shape suddenly are 
either at war or on the border of a war. So that's something to watch out for. Maybe some countries uh, are going into like hyperinflation. Hey, that might also be the UK. Who knows? Um, you've got to understand the economy you're investing in. It's not as simple as investing at home. So let me see if I get this right, Badger. You're you're squeezing poor humble monkey's paws left and right about his decision to use some options and to have a little bit of crypto, sensible crypto in his portfolio. Meanwhile, here you are advising uh, our our gentle listeners about uh, off market off the counter ADRs with lots of letters and then you're saying oh yeah and by the way these things have war and potentially <laughs> will like suck your portfolio dry because uh are you uh you're not as innocent as you seem are you oh for sure but i think these are uh measured risks and if you're if you're investing in a, okay, I put my sort of jokey comments about the UK side. If you're investing in a mature company in a mature economy, that's pretty safe, to be honest. Use your limit orders, understand what you're buying, buy the most highly traded version of it, but that's fairly safe. But at the same time, like right next to that, alongside all the other ADRs, there is a ton of garbage. So, you know, don't click the wrong button. <laughs> right. Yeah. Wise is a legit company, but not all of them are. All right. Hopefully we learned something there. That's, uh, yeah, and if you learn yeah. something, you know, Badger and Monkey are at the beginning of our journey trying to get the good wisdom in front of the people. So if you like this, I think the, the, the whippersnappers say gently press on the like button and uh, tell your friends about us and retweet us on the, on the X, on the, on the YouTubes and the TikToks and the whatever uh, other things. It'll really help us out and get get the good word out. For real. We have a, a woeful double digit uh, subscriber count on YouTube. Go check out the YouTube, hit that subscribe button. You'll be helping us uh, feel like what we're doing is worthwhile. <laughs> exactly. So Badger, you own a company called ISRG, correct? This is intuitive surgical, incredible company. Yes. Uh huh. And uh, as far as I could tell, this company makes up a whopping 13% of your uh, longtime portfolio, correct? You got it. Yeah. My, so real, we, my real, real portfolio. Yeah. Not the so King of the Jungle portfolio. Yeah. What we need is a visit from an owl. I think in this moment to try to talk some sense into you. Tell us why, tell us, tell us what it is you think you're doing. I really want to die uh, one day having never sold a single share of this company. I'm, I've got these weird emotional uh, engagement with this stock position, which perhaps goes beyond what might be sensible in terms of portfolio management. I will admit. So I have one very, I think, simple and direct question for you. And this is, uh, this is really coming from a sincere place because I think it's an error almost all investors make, it, it, new or advanced. Because we're dealing with money, we get emotionally attached to our holdings and we forget that the market does not care about us as living breathing beings so we convince ourselves that the market awards medals we think and i'm guilty <laughs> guilty for this that we get a medal if we're the first to buy a company and we also get a medal if we hold on to it a really, really long time, maybe even a certificate. I don't know. I, I maybe <laughs> maybe maybe a portrait painted of, of Badger sitting smoke, smoking his pipe in a in a silk robe for having held Intuitive Surgical for however many years. Newsflash, dear listeners, Badger will not get any medals or portraits painted of him in his silky pajamas. 
That is simply not how it works. And it's a very, very, very hard delusion to walk out from, out from under. How does yeah, that make you feel that there's no medals in this game, Badger? Yeah, no, look, you're quite right. You're quite right. This is one. This is for me only, right? Maybe I'm wearing a hospital gown one day and I'm about to go under the knife and it's an intuitive surgical robot about to uh, do the surgery on me because I wholeheartedly believe this is the future of surgery, of all surgical interventions eventually. And look, let me tell you, let me at least tell you why. Let me make my excuses. I don't expect a Sifka or a, a pad on the back of a gold star. But this was the first ever individual company stock I ever bought, like nearly 20 years ago. I did a bit of index investing and stuff. I built a bit of money. This was the thing I bought first. And I bought probably an irresponsibly big position in it. And I really just don't want to trim this one. I just, <laughs> I've trimmed Shopify, I've trimmed Netflix, you know, the ones that drove my portfolio returns. This is my biggest allocation. But look, it, I, my hard limit is 20% allocation. If this gets, let's say this, if this grows faster than the rest of my portfolio and it goes from being a 13% to a 20% allocation, I think let's come back and have a conversation and I'll, I might reluctantly have to sell, but I kind of, I kind of hope this one just grows nicely in line with the portfolio and it becomes a very, it's, it's already a pretty big number for me, but it becomes a very big number for me. Uh, but it still doesn't get beyond that 20% marker. Cause like I say, I really want to die having not had to sell a share of this one. I love that coffee can portfolio. I think that'll be my kind of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger moment where I can point at this one and say, Hey, look at this. This is long-term investing, buddy. Okay. I'm, I'm still sniffing a lot of ripe Ron bananas <laughs> in your explanation. So I got, I got a couple of solutions for you, buddy. One, just, just keep one share. We'll print it. We'll make a certificate. We'll even put it in a gold frame, maybe neon lights pointing like uh, to the certificate and uh, your portrait next to it with a big sign, never sold ever. <laughs> and that will satisfy this, 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 uh, this craving to be recognized for, for your, your having honored your sacred duty to this company. But all joking aside, here's the better question. You don't own any shares today at this valuation, meaning if you didn't and you just do the research, let's leave taxes out of it for a moment. Are you going to buy the same allocation today at these prices, knowing what no. you know about the company? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm over allocated based on my conviction level about the company, but I don't mind owning six or seven percent allocation probably half what i own now isn't it? Mm. Mm. well that's a very important data point and now uh and badger badger is smart sometimes he's too smart for his own good but here's what i'm thinking is going or, or is that me i don't know <laughs> we're all crazy animals after all here's my listeners i think this is what's going to happen because Badger also really listens and he learns, and this is what makes him such a good investor. After just publicly saying that he probably owns 50% more than he than is wise, I can't wait to see what happens a week from now when we rec record, when he's had time to process that and see if he's made any decisions about uh, sell selling or not. Well, we shall see. It's going to take more than a week. I think it's a couple of years before I'm confronted with this question, really confronted with it. Are you a badger or a turtle? Yeah. Sometimes you've got to do a bit of both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't make money by selling. Or maybe you do. Maybe you do. That might bring us on to our next topic quite nicely. Indeed. We are calling this segment the... <laughs> Where'd you get that from? <laughs> The golden goose. This is why you got to subscribe on YouTube, guys. If you're on the audio only, you can't see this glorious golden helmet. That, uh, oh, it is so sparkly. It is so sparkly. So this is a little bit uh, more convoluted than I'd like, but I was forced to sell my first position from the King of the Jungle Challenge, and that was my 
uh, my tokens in Chainlink, which is a cryptocurrency. The the reason that I, I guess, quote unquote, was forced to sell it is because the platform I was using, SoFi, sent me a notice that they're closing down the crypto segment and they're going to move the account over to some other podunk crypto thing. And I was like, I do not want to mess with that. And so I sold the position. Uh, I still want to own Chainlink. I just need to figure out how I'm going to buy it so that it's easy to keep track of for our competition purposes. But uh, that's that's the technicalities. The more important thing is that there's a saying in investing. You never go broke taking a profit. If all you're doing is making trades and closing them at a profit, you're doing okay. So this is my first sell and it closed, dear Badger, at a 31% profit, which is very pleasing to me. And hence, my first golden egg has been laid. That's pretty cool, dude. You see, you've made a 31% profit in what, like a month? That's a pretty healthy return. Yeah, if we analyze that, uh, I'll be uh, sailing around on a bunch of yachts. You got it. Right. I, I mean, I will I'll push back a little bit on you wearing your your winning cap because that's not the thesis i guess right or well, that's not the objective like the objective isn't to make 30 percent in a week i mean clearly i can't argue that's a great return right if you could do that reliably every week then it won't be long before you own the world but um but the goal is to make like 30 times 300 times your money which is going to take more than a week but you know it's doable within 10 years if you get lucky and you have you know, the right companies in your portfolio. I always, I kind of cry a little bit inside if a, com a great company I own gets acquired or, you know, they get delisted for some reason, because then you've lost the ability to keep riding that thing to the moon, as the Redditors might say. Yeah, so uh, that's right. I want to buy back the chain link I sold. I just have to figure out how I'm going to do it for competition purposes. But I thought this would be a good segment to tell our listeners just a little bit about why I chose Chainlink as my one and only crypto so far. Banks, and you you worked in a bank, correct? I did, 25 you, years, HSBC, yeah. yes. Yeah. So you know this be better than anyone, but uh, I'm going to define banks as organized groups of people who own all the things. <laughs> in other words, this is where banks are, where assets and who own and who uh, banks own assets in, in, in a sense, right? They own mortgages, they own commercial real estate, they own residential real estate, and they make loans, right? I, th I don't think that would be the accepted definition. They might facilitate those things and they, you know, they kind of, you know, they, they make borrowing and they create like this cyclicality in the economy, but go on, we'll go with your definition. Yeah, it's not a million yeah. miles off. What's really going on? Yeah. And, yeah. and so what I think many people don't understand what crypto is. So here's a, here's the most simplified explanation I, I can, I could offer is that banks use ledgers to keep track of who owns what in, in short. And let, let's just say even more simply, like, you know, like a book, a ledger, you know, a book, it's a spreadsheet or it's a massive database, but essentially, you know, there's rows of things and then kind of who owns those things. That's what you mean, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So banks have a way of uh, writing down in their ledgers who owns what things. Blockchains are an advance technologically and mathematically a new fancier form of ledgers that are mathematically secure and public. That's essentially all you need to know. And everything that the crypto world is building that is legit is premised on this fact that instead of keeping the who owns what private and out of sight the way banks do, you make all of that information secure and public so that the transactions are invoyable and open for everybody to examine. So that's the premise of crypto. What is Chainlink? 
Chainlink is the platform of services that will allow all banks to connect their ledgers to the blockchain form of ledgers. And it will it's the platform that will allow all of the blockchains, because there's many of them, to connect to one another. So think of it as, uh, I think of it as, um, at, by analogy, when the internet was first a separate series of computers, they were not yet talking to one another. So they were like disparate networks in their own individual pods. But the moment the computer scientists figured out a platform or protocol to connect them all, you had one protocol that drove the internet, right? And it was open source and now we, and the world changed, right? Think about how quickly, by the way, that changed 20 years or so, right? The entire uh, human civilization changed because of this one protocol. Chainlink is doing the same exact thing, but for blockchains. It's connecting, it's built a platform that is a protocol that is helping banks bring real world assets onto blockchains so that they run more securely and more transparently and you get rid of all of the black box shenanigans that drive economic crises because blockchains are simply a better way of keeping track of things. And, they're, and Chainlink is bringing all of that stuff onto blockchains and connecting the blockchains via protocol that is, I, that is via analogy identical to the way the internet was born. And we are still very, very early in this adoption curve. I can't say I really understand it still. So do I, as a consumer, say as an individual who has some money and some accounts and I've got a few random cryptocurrencies and a chunk of Ethereum, do I, could I use Chainlink in some way? Or this is just for the institutions? And what do they actually do with it? Yeah, you do use it's uh you will be using Chainlink, but for us it's going to be running in the background. Sort of like when you turn on your computer and you use the internet, you're not really messing with TCIPP, right? You just open your laptop, you go to your website and it runs. So anytime you let's say trade Ethereum or use Ethereum in whatever way, the way that your trades and executions run properly is when Chainlink is doing its job behind the scenes. So you wouldn't necessarily as a person be using Chainlink the way institution. I mean, you will, but, 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 in, but quietly, so to speak, it's if your business, if you're running a business using Web 3.0, using cryptography, then you will be hiring Chainlink to perform a whole bunch of services for you. And if you're a okay. bank, like Australia and New Zealand, you're really hiring Chainlink to make sure that their migration onto blockchain is done in the most effective and secure and trust minimized way. So that is Chainlink, and I'll be looking to buy back. Very good. I hope that goes well for you. We find a simple way to do that. So you no longer own Chainlink, but you do own a bunch of other stuff. Uh, you pulled the numbers yesterday. So how are we looking? What's the big picture of the king of the jungle challenge? Here we are. So we are what, uh, a month into the challenge. And according to this graph, we have this ugly gray line is barely squeaking above the golden yellow at what, about 1100, right? Badger's at about 1160. And Monkey right now is about, his portfolio is back to about $1,000. But that's in part because we just each added 100 bucks on the beginning of the month. So Badger is up uh, a little bit overall, about $60 or so. Overall, and Monkey is down about a hundred bucks from the start. Cool, but once you have now got some extra money, you've got that extra hundred bucks in your account as of like the first a few days ago. So I guess you've got a plan to invest that. You're just going to dump it back into Coherus, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I did think about that this morning on my run. I was having all kinds of good ideas. Uh, 
to be determined. But yeah, I am contemplating adding more coheres and I'm also contemplating adding a third short to my yeah. portfolio. I'm just waiting for the right time to do that. And that's because unlike Badger, I take market signals seriously and I know how to read what the market's telling me. And so while I was early on the KRE and Bank of America puts, I, I, I'm not going to be early on the the next short trade that I have lined up. Very good. Do you want to reveal what it is or you can save it until you've pulled the button? I'll save it's it. Till, yeah, I'll save it okay. till, till I actually do it. What about you? What's your strategy for all of, all of these uh, bananas sitting in your yeah. portfolio? You know, I'm, like I said last week, I'm I'm sort of doing better than I thought I would be at this time. Uh, only a month in, I've got four hundred dollars uninvested. I'm just going to keep dollar cost averaging. I'm probably going to buy my next favorite company. Took another hundred bucks in that sometime this week. I'll uh, I'll decide what that is. Maybe maybe, I'm, maybe it should be intuitive surgical. I don't think that's going to change my favor my fortunes in the game uh, over such a short period this is a company where you make money in the very long term i need to optimize for things that are going to make us play slightly higher volatility than my normal stock um probably not ready to double down on something just yet i think i'll try and get at least seven or eight positions in there before i do that okay well best of luck to you badger all right, listeners, so we're on YouTube and all the major podcast platforms. Subscribe now for a financial podcast that's as fun and playful as it is insightful. You can also find us at wallstreetwildlife.com, a starting point for those that know there's an intelligent and principled way to become wealthy but haven't yet found a good jungle guide. Luke and I are also both lead advisors at 7investing.com. If you subscribe with the coupon code WILDLIFE, you'll get a handsome discount off of any annual membership. You can also find us both on Twitter slash X. We've got to stop saying Twitter. We just call it X. I think people know what we're talking about now. Uh, but we'll be Xing our regular portfolio updates in the King of the Jungle Challenge. You can find me at 7 Luke Hallard. And I'm um, the number 7, just like Luke 7, at 7 Flying Platypus. Tweet us with any topics you'd like us to cover and let us know whether you're Team Badger or Team Monkey as the challenge evolves. Are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.